Well, thank you, Tony, so much for inviting me and also for all of your leadership uh, over the years to uh, work towards the implementation of alternative materials for reinforced concrete, especially FRP. And uh, you don't like to think of yourself this way, but I consider you one of the grandparents of uh, FRP. So, uh, so again, thank you so much for the leadership. So I'll talk a little bit just for those maybe that aren't as involved, engaged in uh, FRP materials, uh, a little bit about ACI 440. And, um, and I do want to thank Tony. He was very helpful in providing some content for this presentation. So I, I did want to include him uh, on the, the header here. In terms of ACI activities, I've kind of broken this into um, talking about ACI 440 and some of the developments of specifications that have flowed in, flown into ASTM. And then secondly, I want to come back and talk a little bit about um, a little bit about some implementation projects where we've gone out and we've looked at the durability of these materials after a number of years in the field. CI committee structure here, uh, you can see there's a, there's a number of subcommittees uh, that work on content related to fiber reinforced. Um, in this context, what you're going to see this evening, we're mainly focused on FRP reinforced concrete and the standard that is used to um, design for uh, FRP structures uh, with, a, with a view towards building facilities. Um, there are also several other committees involved. Uh, one of them is uh, the ACI for, uh, the ACI uh, 440K, which is the FRP materials characterization. Uh, this uh, subcommittee is co-chaired by Chuck Bacus of Penn State and Russ Gentry of Georgia Tech. And it's actually a joint committee. So products that are worked on under this committee then flow into uh, serving as an ASTM standard. On your on your left, you can see the current ACI uh, 440 document for design of FRP. In the middle, you can see a sample specification that's been developed under the K subcommittee and uh, also a document from ASTM uh, just as a sample. These are all products that have flowed directly out of uh, the work here at ACI. Currently, um, the main design document that was last published in 15 is is undergoing is undergoing uh, a new version. Uh, you can see that the current plan is to get a remaining number of code chapters balloted and completed um, this coming year. There's also a new bar construction spec that's under under work. And these are some of the other documents that uh, are in process at 440K, just to give you an idea, uh, being used by, um, by, worked on by the committee. The, the chapter itself uh, for the revised version that we hope will be published next year, um, these uh, have already come through the main 440 committee. And these here are ready to ballot. Uh, we have meetings this week uh, looking at these various chapters of the document. On the bridge side, and um, our, one of our coming speakers, Richard, will talk about this a little bit more, but there has also been standards developed for bridge design. The first one, first edition was in 2009. And in December of uh, last year, um, the 2018 second edition uh, was published. So these now uh, provide guidance for uh, departments of transportation uh, to design using uh, FRP and bridges as well. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, I think, the first large-scale study in the United States looking at the actual durability performance. Uh, FRP materials are linear elastic. If we use mild steel, as many of you know, uh, we design it for yield strength. 
We can count on strain hardening, so we can always count on additional capacity uh, that's in a mild steel material. Uh, for FRP, it's a linear elastic, and so one of the concerns has always been the long-term performance. And so I want to show you a little bit of what we're working on uh, through the strategic development part of the ACI Foundation. And this work uh, involved uh, several stakeholders, several universities, as you can see here, University of Miami, Penn State University, Owens Corning, uh, as well as my home institution. And this was uh, funded uh, through Owens Corning and the ACI Foundation Strategic Development Council, which allowed work in this area. And the actual uh, investigation focused on bridges that were built 15 to 20 years ago and looking at the durability of these materials by uh, autopsy and taking cores from the structures and, and comparing what we have out in the field with pristine bars. One thing I want to mention is when these projects were let, many of them used, for example, an older generation of resin. Uh, polyester resin, for example. So we felt pretty good that if we're looking at these older bridges and they look pretty good, today's products that have been improved, maybe using vinyl ester resins, uh, that, that that was very promising of it. So let me show you um, here in terms of the FRP durability. For those of, that aren't familiar, when we design with these linear elastic materials, we have what we call an environmental reduction factor. That takes into account some degradation that may occur uh, due to performance in the field. And so the concept here was if we can get uh, actual field data and start to create data sets of information over time, that will actually help us refine and recalibrate some of these reduction factors, making the material more cost effective uh, for designers. So far, we've actually uh, sampled 11 bridges throughout the United States. You can see one located uh, near Amarillo, Texas, up close to the panhandle there. Uh, it was nice that we had a distribution of projects that we were sampling because that area of the country tends to see the highest number of moist freeze-thaw uh, cycles, for example. Other areas of the northern Midwest may have higher concentrations of uh, salts or chlorides applied in the winters. So it was nice starting with a series of bridges in different climate regions with different temperatures uh, for us to start to gather data and information. And these, these range all the way from uh, you know Texas, Missouri, Colorado, Ohio, as you can see the bridges that are listed there. Uh, here's one sample. This was one of the first projects that was built in 2000. This is Sierra de la Cruz Creek Bridge in Texas. Uh, this project was really uh, led by Tim Bradbury, one of our committee members uh, that helped really lead the implementation of this. When these bridges were done, you can see it had a GFRP top mat and a bottom mat of more traditional mild steel. So the top mat closest to the top of the deck that would typically see the you know higher concentrations of salt uh, applications are there. Uh, this was a seven span bridge. What we did was you can see the universities and organizations represented here at the top. Uh, we had a series of both concrete tests as well as GFRP tests and we tried to include a series of round robin testing so that each test was done hopefully at, at least one or more institution, so we could see if we were getting similar results. Uh, we also wanted this to sort of be the framework, so for future bridges that we sample from, we try to do these same series of tests, and uh, we'll be working on ACI 440L uh, to try to get organizations that are interested in sampling bridges that have been uh, constructed or structures that have been constructed with these series of tests. I'll give you a little bit of uh, flavor uh, due to time. I won't go into great depth, but just to give you a flavor of some of the tests that have been done. 
Uh, here you can just see sort of the sampling that's been done. Some bridges we were able to take more cores, some fewer. You can see the Gills Creek uh, table on the lower right-hand side. That's in Virginia. One of the difficulties is when you take a core, determining where you're going to get an actual FRP bar. So you see some of the cores that we took actually had no cross-section of bar in it because we're taking a 4-inch diameter core when we when we core it. So of course in the future it would be nice to develop some non-destructive technologies to determine uh, where the bars are located for better accuracy. Care is taken when the, the sample is extracted from the concrete as you can see on the left. What we undertook was fiber content so this involves uh, taking the a sort, sort sample the material and essentially burning off the resin. So we're trying to see and make sure that uh, the fiber content is still there. Uh, we did two different techniques. One technique uh, where we tried to eliminate some of the filler material. So we had a more accurate actual percentage of the actual fiber relative to, to the fiber resin content. Another test was uh, SEM tests, and here we're looking at the microstructural degradations of both the fiber as well as the resin. And uh, here you can see some of the equipment that was used uh, to do that. Uh, on your left, you'll see an EDS test. This actually looks at the chemistry, chemical composition of both the fiber and the resin, and this, this can be compared to a pristine test, for example, to see if there's any changes uh, in the chemical composition. And in the fibers, you can see some of the content um, in the second line that you would tend to look for to see if there's any changes due to the alkaline environment uh, of the concrete, for example, that may change it. Uh, we also looked at moisture content. Now, this was something that was uh, new. Uh, there's no real specification for when you take a sample out of the field, how do you control the environment that that um, sample is in. So it's something that we spent quite a bit of time talking about. But here we were trying to look at what the in situ moisture content was uh, of the materials and if it changed at different locations around the country, for example. Uh, the next test is a horizontal short shear test. So this takes a, a short sample. Uh, the length of the specimen is a function of the diameter of the bar. And we did have some different bar sizes, but here uh, you can see the standard uh, suggests you do five tests. Obviously, that's difficult uh, when you're taking cores and samples. Uh, but again, trying to develop a, a database and compare it to the tests uh, that was done early on. Glass transition temperature. So this is an area where under high temperature environments, the, the resin can break down, can cause problems with the structural integrity of the material. Um, this was kind of interesting. Um, the way the bars are or composites are often autoclaved in the aviation industry, oft, oftentimes you get 100% full cure of the material. Um, here we actually saw that in most cases the glass transition temperature improved over the years it was in the field, so it was actually getting higher um, due to the post-curing effects uh, in the field. Uh, and then we also did uh, a modified tensile test, so in that uh, bridge in Texas that I showed you, we, uh, um, sample bars uh, were installed in the bridge deck that could be taken out later to do tensile testing on. Uh, this shows you, this was the only bridge, by the way, where we were able to extract samples long enough to, to do a tensile test. Uh, and here are the results of that. So uh, once normalized, you can see after 17 years that uh, there was a 2.13% difference in the tensile capacity. So very limited, small change. Um, now, we would like to, of course, test more samples and have a larger database uh, of that. 
And I'll wrap up very quickly here with uh, some of the concrete tests. We were interested to see if the pH of the concrete was. They're generally in the range of 11 to 12, which is uh, expected for the age of these bridges. Also looked at carbonation. Obviously, once the concrete becomes carbonated, if there's mild steel in the deck, it's more susceptible to uh, corrosion. But we were interested to look at that. And there wasn't much carbonation there. Uh, similar with the chloride content, two methods were used. We looked at the chloride content levels. They were generally in, insignificant, which meant the quality of the concrete was, was still in quite very good shape. Uh, and then finally, the conclusions. So um, we did look at 11 bridges, uh, and we did look at the physical, chemical, and mechanical conditions of the bars. And uh, again, this is help, helpful to validate the long-term performance of GFRP bars and give uh, both owners and designers confidence that we can use these materials moving forward, particularly in, in bridge depth deck applications. And you saw after 17 years, uh, at least in the tensile test, we, we saw 2.13% uh, degradation. So that would be about 12.5% over 100 years. Right now, the C sub E environmental reduction factor is 30% that we use in the design standard. So you can see that even in 100 years, based on this very limited amount of information, things look very good. And I will turn the podium back over to Tony for the next presentation.